Hi everybody, I'm Joe Parker of the Pixel Depot, where we give model railroaders the knowledge, tools, and services they need to build a realistic layout and the motivation to work on it right now. Now, before I jump in, I want to welcome all my subscribers, especially any new subscribers. There have been quite a few of you lately, so welcome aboard. Today's video is a bit of a hat trick of the things that I mentioned in the introduction. So we're going to go through the tools. I'm going to talk about a free tool that you can download in order to go ahead and build this image. We're also going to talk about some knowledge, that is best practices and other tips that you can follow as we go about building our background image. And finally, we're going to talk about services, and I'm going to do that right now. So I know that even after watching this video, there are going to be some modelers out there who are not going to want to take on this task. So I wanted to let you know Know that I am available for services such as these and if you are interested in talking to me about those you can contact me at jparker at thepixeldepot.com via email. I'm going to show you how to create a layered backdrop photo from various images that we'll edit together to form a single coherent image. Given the recent debate on the channel around cost in the hobby and making things from scratch this video seems timely. I was able to create this backdrop photo for only the cost of the paper and the printer toner used to print it out. Well, and some adhesive spray to attach to the backdrop. Now, early in the process of building the grunge, which is the small shelf layout you see behind me, I decided I wanted a backdrop photo to use along its entire length. Now, this would give the layout, which is only 15 inches from front to back, a feeling of depth. After rejecting several commercial options as either unsuitable or too expensive, I decided to create my own image, built up from photo elements I found online. After I posted the video about building the backdrop, I got a bunch of requests from people wanting to know how I did it so that they could make their own. So I promised a video showing how I did it. What a mistake that was. Ever had one of those days? The making of this video has been a series of those days, and for a while I thought it was going to send me to an institution, but more on that later. There's a lot to cover on this project, so I've actually broken it up into a couple of different parts. In this video, we're going to talk about the basics of using photo manipulation software. So I'm going to go through the software and kind of teach you how to use it in a basic way. We're going to talk about the difference between working with things on the screen and how things work in print, because there are some differences there that it's going to be worth knowing about. And then we're going to go ahead and get started on our image. If you're really familiar with image manipulation software, you may want to skip the next couple of sections. However, if you're not used to using this kind of software, I would really suggest you follow along as I'm going to go through and talk about how to use the tools and some tips of using the software, as well as some gotchas that you might run into along the way. This is the image we're going to build up using our various elements. It was created from five individual wall images, a sidewalk image that was copied and pasted multiple times, a fire hydrant image, and a color layer to represent some haze. Now I needed to manipulate each element in some form, place them in the image canvas, and do some final adjustments to each one before I got it to look like this. And we'll cover all those steps here. When I made the backdrop for the grunge, I used Photoshop, which is the gold standard for this kind of image work. I've owned it for years, so I'm very familiar with the version that I have. Now, my version is older and has a perpetual license, but these days Photoshop is available as a subscription for around $21 a month. Now, I realize not everyone wants to buy a subscription, so for this tutorial, I decided to use GIMP, which is short for GNU Image Manipulation Program. GIMP. This is a full-featured program for working with images that has many of the same features that Photoshop does, and it's absolutely free, although they do request a donation if you like the software. This tutorial will show you how to create this project with GIMP, although I'll mention some places where it differs from Photoshop along the way. Now, you might ask why we want to use an advanced image manipulation program like GIMP or Photoshop for this project instead of something simple like MS Paint. The answer is clearly that I needed content for the channel, and MS Paint wouldn't really require a video for a tutorial. Not true. There are actually a couple of reasons. First, the advanced programs give you a lot more tools to get your different elements looking exactly how you want them, including the ability to do things like scaling, rotation, distortion, and skewing of the images. Second, and perhaps even more importantly, it allows you to work in layers, which in turn allows you to keep all of your image elements separate so that you can manipulate them individually or in groups that you select. The images you work with in these programs have at least one layer, and you can add more layers as you go. 
You can think of image layers like individual panes of glass with photos taped onto them. If there's nothing on a pane or that portion of the pane, you can see right through. But as soon as you start putting pictures on the glass, it will block the view of anything on the panes of glass behind it. You can also change the order of the glass panes, and as a result, you might be able to see different elements, or not, depending on what layer is on top. It's the same with layers in a drawing program. You can put elements of an image on certain layers, and furthermore, in specific locations on those layers. You can then manipulate those pieces, but having each bit on its own layer allows you more control of how and where to place things. Now, I acquired the images I used for walls from a website called textures.com. It is not a free site, but if you sign up, you do get a certain number of free credits that you can use to get images, and those free images are what I used for my raw materials. I also found the fire hydrant image using Google Image Search. This is a really, really handy tool, and I use it all the time. Now, the sidewalk and the original grunge image came from in somewhere. I couldn't locate the original again. So for the tutorial, I grabbed the sidewalk from my original grunge project. Stay tuned to find out where you'll be able to get that sidewalk image. As we go along, I'm going to use some terms over and over that are used somewhat interchangeably, but are actually a little different in practice. These terms are dots per inch, or DPI, and pixels per inch, or PPI. You'll often hear DPI used to cover both terms, and in fact, I do that all the time. But technically, DPI refers to the printed page, while PPI refers to what you see on your computer screen. They're used when we're talking about the resolution of an image, and resolution is determined somewhat differently in print than it is on the screen. This relationship between what you see on the screen and what is on the printed page can be a little confusing. <laughs> Essentially, it's all about that dot about that dot, no dashes, and how many are in a given space. All printing is made up of dots, which can be different colors, and the density of dots is what determines the DPI. So if you hear someone say 300 DPI, what that means is that a one inch square on the page would be 300 dots by 300 dots. If you print at 150 DPI, that one inch square would be 150 dots by 150 dots. What you see on a screen is a little different. Each dot on your computer monitor, mobile device, or even a flat screen TV for that matter, is a pixel. That's how it displays everything, by varying the color and light intensity of each dot, and there are only so many on that surface. You can't change the number of pixels in a given space on the screen. So if an image is a certain size, 900 pixels by 1200 pixels, for example, and the number of pixels on a given screen is static, changing the PPI value means that the amount of space required to show those dots changes. In other words, if you have an image on the screen that is 300 pixels by 300 pixels at 300 PPI, it'll appear on the screen as a one inch by one inch square. If you change that same image to 150 PPI, well, it still has 300 pixels in each dimension, so the image size changes from one inch square to two inches square. The density goes a long way to determine how clear the picture looks on the paper. Typically, the more dots per inch, the sharper the image can be because more dots means it's easier to depict detail. However, the more dots you have in your computer image, especially for a large image like this, the more memory you're going to use. So sometimes compromises have to be made. We're going to use 150 DPI. Hopefully that made sense. Either way, for simplicity, when we're talking about resolution, I'm still going to call them both DPI. One more difference between printed dots and screen pixels. The colors in printing are CMYK, which means they're made up by combining four colored dots. You have cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. By changing the density of these colors in a given space, all the colors of the rainbow nearly can be created. On screen, however, colors are made up using RGB color, and that is a combination of red, green, and blue. By changing the intensity of these colored dots, all the colors we see on screen can be made. Since on screen and print colors are made up differently, sometimes colors on screen are not exact matches for what prints out. The programs do their best to make the conversion, but it's not always perfect, so keep that in mind. A disclaimer before we begin. As I said, I'm using GIMP so that you can see how to do this using a free tool, but I'm primarily a Photoshop user, so I had to kind of learn GIMP, the GIMP along the way to do this video. So some of the things I show you here may have shortcuts or easier ways to do it in GIMP that I'm just not aware of. Also, I made some assumptions along the way that may end up being incorrect. If you're a regular GIMP user and notice I'm doing things the hard way or that my assumptions are wrong, please let us all know in the comments. 
The size of the backdrop I made for the grunge is seven inches tall by 90 inches long, but the size of the working image we're going to create will be 10 inches tall by 55 inches long. The reason for the 10 by 55 space is that we want to have some extra space so that we can move things around easily and it'll allow us to see everything. Too much space when you're working on this is better than too little, so it gives you some flexibility, at least for now. We will crop the image down to the final size of 7 inches by roughly 48 inches when we're done editing. And we'll use two sets of that image to fill the space on the backdrop. So, enough preliminaries, let's get started on our image. I can hear you saying, oh, finally. Bring out the GIMP. I've opened GIMP here. As you can see, when you first open the program, it's got the menu bars and toolbars here toward the top left and some other tools over here on the right that we'll look at shortly. This area in the middle is where we'll be doing our work on different images, but there's nothing here at the moment because we haven't opened any images or created a new project. So let's create our new image right now. If I click on the file menu and select new, the first thing you see is a dialog box where you're going to tell GIMP the image size that you want to work with. It wants to give us an image with dimensions of 1600 pixels wide by 1233 high. It's defaulting to the size of the last image we worked on. For this particular image, I know the size I want in inches, so I'm going to use the drop down to select inches and then set the image size to 55 inches by 10 inches. The image is currently set to a resolution of 240 pixels per inch and RGB color. GIMP also does some calculations for you, so it shows you that at those settings, the image size will be 13,200 by 2400 pixels. However, we don't want to use 240 dpi as we discussed earlier. I want it to be 150 dpi, so I'm going to enter that into this field. Now you'll notice that I type this into the field, and this button slash box here shows a link of a chain, which means that the fields are linked. So when I click out of that field, you can see that GIMP automatically modifies the other field. Now if you were to click off that link, you could set the fields to different values, but I can't honestly think of a reason why we'd do that, so we're just going to leave it the way it is. The color space for this image is set to RGB. GIMP does not have an option for CMYK, although Photoshop does allow you to create images with CMYK colors. But given what we're doing here for the backdrop and the fact that it's going to end up being a little bit fuzzy, RGB color should be fine to work with. The last thing we want to do is make sure that GIMP doesn't automatically put a background color in for our new image. We actually want to fill it with nothing. You can see here that it's set to fill with background color on the dialog box, and so we want to change this value to transparency so that when the image is created, it has no color in the background. Click OK, and the screen changes to show this long image, which is 10 inches high by 55 inches wide. And you'll notice there's a checkerboard pattern throughout, and that indicates the transparency and tells us that the whole image is currently empty. There are a couple of things that will help us that I want to call out right away. First is that there are rulers here on the top and the sides, and currently those are shown in inches. We can change the measurement units down here. I believe that the first time that you start GIMP, it's set to pixels and it looks something like this. But since we're working in inches, I'm going to change the rulers back to inches. The other thing you see here is the zoom setting, which is currently set to 18.2%. You can change it to various different sizes using the dropdown. I'm going to set this to 25% so that the image fits our space better. I'm going to describe a quick shortcut you can use for zooming. Most mice these days have a roller wheel on them. Uh, on my mouse it looks like this. You can see here on the cursor that in the upper left it shows you the tool you've selected, in this case the move tool. On the lower right there's a four pointed arrow which I believe indicates that the base function is to move things. When I press and hold the control key that's going to change. In GIMP, I believe that triggers a path tool, but what it also means is that if you use the roller wheel, the image will zoom in and out. Usually when I'm working, that's how I change the zoom. I find that way easier than continually going down to the drop down. So as we're going along, if you see the size changing really quickly, that's how I'm doing it. The next thing we want to do is open up the images that we got from textures.com. To do that, we'll go to the file menu and choose open. I preset things so that it would open to the right folder so I didn't have to waste time searching through the drive, but when you do this you may need to direct it to the appropriate folder where you saved your images. These are our five images that we want to open. Now we could open them one at a time, but we don't have to. 
we can select multiple images and open them all at once. I can click on the image name at the top and then holding down the shift key, click on the bottom image name and that will select all five. I could also select them individually by holding the control key down and clicking on each file name. And you can actually toggle those clicking on and off uh, if you're holding down the control key to select it and deselect it. That'll let you pick some files and not others, but we wanna pick all five. So we do that, click the open button and GIMP will open the files. Now as it's doing that, I wanna direct your attention over here. These images that GIMP is opening, or the file names anyway, are showing over here. This is the GIMP library, and it shows the last number of images, it looks like 10, that GIMP opened. So you can see our texture images listed here, one through five. Once the images are closed, you could click on these file names again, and GIMP would open them. So it's a nice shortcut for getting to files that you've recently used. The next thing I want to show you is this tabbed area over here, which shows the images that are currently open with a tab for each image. This also gives you a quick way to move between the images that are currently open in the program. This one is our new image, and as I click through the others, it shows our five different texture images. As I do that, I want you to notice that they are not all the same size. And that means we'll have to do some adjustments on them. It's particularly noticeable, I think, when I go from this image number five to number one. Watch when I click. Number one is definitely taller, and I actually think it's a little wider. So we're gonna need to do some work to get these all to be a similar size. Let's talk about our image layers. When you create a new image like we have done here, it starts out with a single layer. And we can see our layers by clicking over here in the info panel and selecting layer. Imagine that. You can see we currently have a single layer and it is the background layer. Layers work a little differently in GIMP than they do in Photoshop, so this took me a little while to get used to. GIMP pastes whatever you've selected into the currently selected layer in the working image. So you have to be a little bit more careful to create layers as you go. Having said all that, let's start to build our new backdrop image. We're going to create a new layer and we do that by going to the layer menu and selecting new layer. In the dialog box that appears, we can name it. I called it image one. You can see I've been practicing and then click OK. You can see over here that there's now a new layer in our list. We'll copy our texture images in as we go and make some adjustments. First though, I want to work on our image number one and get that set up so that it's the right size before we paste it into our working image. So if we go back to image number one and look at the file size, and you can do that by going to the image menu and clicking scale image, you'll see that when we start, this image is 6.667 inches wide by 5.138 inches high, and it's using a resolution of 240 PPI. The first thing I wanna do is change this to 150 DPI to match our new image. And the reason I do that first is that if we change the width and height values and then change the resolution, the program would automatically recalculate the size based on the total number of pixels, and we don't want that. Again, this goes back to our discussion on resolution and how it works on the screen. What I really want is for the height of this to be seven inches. So when I enter that, because our aspect ratio is locked, that's going to automatically recalculate and make our width just over nine inches. When I click scale, you're gonna notice that it changes size on the screen, and that's because between the resolution change and the size change, the number of pixels has also changed. So it shrinks a little bit on the screen. I did this because seven inches is going to be the height of our backdrop, and this will be the master image that we use to resize all the others to match. I'm assuming that since all these photos came from the same photographer, that the height to width ratio is the same on all of them. And if we can scale the images so that all the heights match up, the width should take care of themselves. Now we wanna copy this image to our new canvas. And I'm gonna do that by using Control A to select the whole image, and then Control C to copy it into the clipboard. Now I prefer to use keyboard shortcuts as I find them to be a whole lot faster, but if you're not familiar with them or don't like to use the keyboard shortcuts, you can do the same thing by going to the select menu and choosing all, and then going to the edit menu and selecting copy. Now if we choose the new image from the tab, and since our image number one is already in the clipboard, I'm gonna paste it in using control V. If you don't wanna use the keyboard shortcut, you can paste it in going to the edit menu and choosing paste. Now using the move tool, I'm gonna to put my cursor over the image, then click and hold the left mouse button. And when I move the cursor, it will drag the image. I'm moving it to the lower left corner. I'll zoom in so that you can see this a little better. 
you'll notice that the outline of our workspace is shown as a yellow dotted line, and the outline of our image is another dotted line, although actually it's more of a marquee since the border dots move. As we move the image for placement, we can notice a few things. If we move the image so that it's outside the edge of the workspace, you can tell that because the borders still show. This will be useful for us here because we want to make sure that this image is right up against the edge. You'll notice that if it's too far inside the workspace, you can see the checkerboard pattern. If it's too far outside, we lose some of the picture. So we want to make sure that it's right up against the edge. You can also use the arrow keys on the keyboard to do fine adjustments. And if you do that, GIMP will move the image one pixel at a time. That way you can make sure that it is right at the bottom left edge. So we've now placed our master image, and now we want to make sure that all the other images are the same size. And to help us do that, we want to place some guidelines so that it's easier to line things up. If I zoom in, you'll see that there's this blue speckled bar that's the roof line of the building. And we're also going to use that as the top of our image. So to make sure that that will be the top edge of every image, I'm going to create a guide. I do that by going up to the ruler, clicking and holding the left mouse button, and dragging down you'll see that there's this white line that's coming down along with the cursor. We drag that down to the top of the image and release the button. And now if we zoom out, you can see that it's created a guideline that goes across the entire screen. I'm gonna do that once more down near the bottom of the image. So again, if I zoom in, you can see the difference in the texture. This area is brick and this area is as well, but this area is most likely concrete even though the whole thing's been painted. I wanted to have a sidewalk on the final image. I'm going to use this line where the brick meets the concrete as our ground level and use that to guide both the brick line on each texture image as well as the top of the sidewalk that we're going to add later. So again, I grab a guideline from the ruler and drag it down so that it's right on the bottom of that concrete line. And when I zoom out, we now have guidelines that will give us our upper and lower bound for the rest of the images. The bottom of the image is at the 10 inch mark and the top is at 3 inches. So we do some quick math. The difference is the 7 inches we wanted. By the way, now is a great time to save the image. There is nothing worse than doing a lot of work on a project only for something to go wrong or the power to go out or the program to crash or whatever. Don't ask me how I know this. Also, don't ask me how often I still forget to do this and lose work. Special thanks to my Patreon supporters. If you'd like to join my Patreon community to get bonus videos, graphic files, and other goodies, click on the link in the description below. So now if we go to image number two, we're not going to set the image size here like we did for the first image, but I am going to set it to a resolution of 150 dpi so that it matches our new image. Again, we're going to select all and copy the image to the clipboard. In our new image, we're going to create another new layer by going to the layer menu and selecting new layer. We're going to name this layer and then paste in our second image. You can see here that the new image is pasted into layer two, which is on top of layer one. So currently it's blocking part of the wall that lives in layer one. And you can also see that this image is much taller than the piece in layer one. So we need to adjust this image. First, we're going to use the Move tool to move the image out of the way and line it up close to the edge of image one. Next, I'm going to use the United Transform tool, and this tool allows us to do all kinds of transformations and manipulations on the selected image in the layer, like scaling, rotation, and so on. In this case, all we want to do is change the size of this image so that the roof line and the brick line match the first one. So when I click on the image with this tool selected, you can see it gives me a whole bunch of boxes around the edges of our pasted image. The circle in the middle is the pivot point and the boxes in the center and on the edges allow me to resize the image. Now if you click in a different spot, it will distort the image, but we don't need to do that today. Also, if you click the diamonds, you can skew the image, but we don't want to do that now either. What we do want is to move the pivot point as far to the upper left corner as we can. And what this will do is set the point around which our modifications take place. You can see before when I resize the image that GIMP changed the dimensions proportionally around the center of the image. And that's because that's where the pivot point was. So we start by putting the upper left corner of the image right next to the other image so that the sides and top are aligned. Then we can move the pivot point. Now, if we grab the box in the lower right corner by left clicking, then drag, it will change the dimensions of the image. We can do some tweaking to make sure the lower guideline is aligned with that line on the concrete. 
you can see that it resized everything, but left that upper corner in place. And we double checked that our roof line is lined up. Now it's not perfect because you can see that our roof lines here are off. So we need to do some more adjustments. If I click the move tool again, you can see that the program does something. What it's doing is while you have the unified transform tool selected, the program is doing a rough rendering of all the changes you're making. When you click a different tool or click off of that tool, the program does its final calculations and renders the full resolution image based on the adjustments you made. But now I can move the image so that it lines up and then use the transformation tool again to readjust. So we adjust this so that the black lines line up and then transform again so that the bottom line is matched to the guideline. Again, it's not perfect, but it's a backdrop, so it should be good enough. If you were using this to make a photorealistic foreground structure, you'd probably want to be pixel perfect. But for the backdrop where other structures are likely to be in front, close should be good enough. Now, if we go back to our layer, I can show you the benefit of having each image in its own layer. I can turn these on and off independently, and this can really come in handy later if you wanted to add other elements and be able to move them around independently, and we'll end up doing this with our fire hydrant later. Going back to the layer list, notice that layer 2 is shown above layer 1, so if I move the image that's in layer 2, it's going to cover the parts in layer 1 where they overlap. Likewise, if I moved layer 1 so that it showed above layer 2 in the list, now that image would be on top and overlapping things would show from layer 1. Well, it would if I could get that to work, but more on that later. I'm going to add layers 3, 4, and 5 now, and then paste the various images in. I'll copy image 3 into layer 3. Oops, forgot to select the right layer, so I'll undo, then select layer 3, and then paste again. You always want to make sure that you select the correct layer before pasting in GIMP. You may notice when I move the image, you can see it jump a little bit as if it wants to grab onto the guidelines. That's actually what it's doing is snapping to the guideline. This can be really helpful to line things up, but if you don't like it, you can also turn it off. After a series of movements and adjustments, you can get everything lined up. Moving on to image number five, you can see that it has pipes down at the bottom. Likewise, our image number two doesn't go all the way to the bottom edge. Once we add the sidewalk layer, it will cover these problems. We now have our five panels and each are in their own layer, which allows you to move things around independently. The next thing we want to do is the sidewalk. When I created the original backdrop for the grunge, I found a sidewalk image somewhere that I used but I've been unable to locate the image, and so I decided to grab a piece of the sidewalk from my original backdrop image in Photoshop and use it here. And now what I'm gonna do is make that sidewalk image available to anyone on my Patreon page free of charge so that you can use it. That'll save you the hassle of looking around for something to use for a sidewalk on Google. You can follow the link in the description and you'll be able to download that file even if you're not a patron. Unfortunately, the images I got from textures.com are copyrighted, so I can't share those with you directly, but I will put a link to them in the description. So now that the walls are in, and for sure that's the major part of the picture, we still want to add a couple of other things in there. So I talked about a sidewalk before, and next we're going to put that sidewalk in. I also want to add a fire hydrant just so that I can talk a little bit more about layers and you can understand how those things work, as well as to give the image a little bit of variety. We're going to add a haze effect so it looks like the building's a little bit in the distance, and possibly most importantly of all, I'm going to show you how to go about printing all of these so that you can actually put them up on your backdrop. We will cover all of that in the next video. If you have any questions about what I've done so far, need any clarifications or further explanation, let me know in the comments below and I will do my best to include the answers in part two of this video. While you're at it, you might consider giving the video a thumbs up as well as subscribing to the channel so that you won't miss anything. You can check out the links to my right, your left, for more great content from the channel. I'm Joe Parker of the Pixel Depot. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you'll meet me next time in the train room.